MIDs and enduring rivalries. Here you can see British soldiers patrolling the border between Guatemala and Belize in the 1980s. War is statistically rare when you consider the total possible opportunities for war. This was originally observed by Quincy Wright in his study of war, 1942, commissioned during the Second World War, and by mathematician Lewis Richardson in his 1960 Statistics of Deadly Quarrels. They noticed that you have huge numbers of pairs of states, but the actual number of wars is very few. In the Carlots of War, which is a study started at the University of Michigan by J. David Singer in 1960, and is the data set we're going to use most frequently in the course, they counted between 1816, which is at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, to 1965, 200,778 dyad years. That means there's 200,000 plus instances where you've got two pairs of countries that can be compared. Some of those are trivial, like Bolivia and Nepal, two territorially locked countries that have no opportunity to fight each other. So some of these dyads are ridiculous. But others of these, like England and Zanzibar, or England and China, even though they're far from each other, have engaged in conflict. So out of these 200,000, there are only 85 wars. Some of those wars have more than two participants or could contain multiply high number of participants. Some of those 85 wars lasted more than one year. But still, in comparison to the total number of opportunities for war, war was very, very rare in the international system. And this is before Napoleon, but we count in the correlates of war since Napoleon because before uh, 1816, we simply didn't have the data to measure things like population, energy production, steel production, uh, finance. So we're really dependent on the recent modern area for most of our data. So what are some of the general trends? We've recorded war since around uh, 3000 before the Common Era, or 3000 BC, the last 5000 years. We're largely dependent on recorded historical information. And that largely depends on literacy, which was itself fostered by urbanization. There is evidence for large scale conflict, including battles that involved thousands of combatants in Europe. We have fields strewn with arrowheads uh, that involved very large numbers of individuals, but we don't know what the cause of the conflict was. It's been forgotten to history, and so it's difficult to attribute political causation to those events. Since AD 1500, the last 500 years of the Common Era, uh, we have reasonable amount of data on major power conflicts, because we have some ability to measure which are the major powers. Before 1500, which was the medieval period in Europe, we have a more fluid international system. But in 1500, a Portuguese sailor by the name of Albuquerque sailed into the Indian Ocean and destroyed all the non-European fleets of the world. And so world history essentially merged with European history because Europeans controlling the world's fleets thereby controlled the uh, major powers outside of Europe because they could be isolated through naval power. So the modern period in the last 500 years is dated to that European dominance of naval power in 1500. So since then we've had 120 great power wars. Now 10 of these great power wars are what we call general wars. Uh, what are also termed world wars. Wars involving most, if not all, of the major powers of the international system, occurring at sea, and occurring on more than one continent simultaneously. Now, why do these general or world wars matter? 
Because 90% of the casualties, meaning the deaths and injuries that have occurred in all wars added together, have occurred in only 10 of these general wars since 1500. Plus, these general wars have had a huge impact on restructuring the political and economic nature of the entire international system. So if we want to understand big wars, we need to focus on those 10 general or world wars. This is one version of a list of those 10 general wars. Many of these wars are agreed to, like the wars of Louis XIV or the Second World War. But there's a lot of dispute over some of the other wars, like the Italian wars and the wars of succession. All of these wars are also aggregates of smaller conflicts than escalated and included the major powers. Non-European wars tended not to have the same systemic effects on the international system because European states generally controlled the oceans after Albuquerque, the Portuguese sailor adventurer, neutralized most of the non-European fleets in the Indian Ocean at the beginning of the 16th century. To have an effect on the entire international system, you need to have a navy that allows you to intervene against the transport of soldiers by ship to other parts of the world. And non-European states didn't have that capability. Almost all of these global wars involved commerce raiding as an economic strategy. Between 1816 and 1918, which is the time that was covered by the Correlates of War Project, which really uh, uh, starts uh, after the Napoleonic conflicts. We don't have data sets before that because we simply lack the historical information on economies and populations before that period. So from 1816 to 1918, most disputes, which we term militarized disputes because they involve uh, threats of military force, and these include war, because some of these disputes escalate to war, were European. Since 90, 1945, the most war-prone regions have been, if you rank them, first the Middle East, then Asia, then Latin America, then Africa, and finally Europe, which is sort of ironic. Europe would have been the target of the most violent conflict if the Cold War ever turned violent in uh, uh, during the Cold War, but it didn't. So the standoff oddly created peace. There are trend changes that indicate that Africa has bypassed Latin America and Asia to be the second most violent continent for interstate violence. Here you can see that trend in the uh, 1990s. So most wars are by the major powers, and half of all the interstate disputes are also by the major powers. Great power wars are becoming less frequent, but when they do occur, they become more severe, which means they're associated with more deaths. Here you can see a US aircraft carrier. So this tells us that great powers have a special role to play in war, and they should be studied. Great powers are typically defined as having 10% of the glo global power base in order to qualify as a great power. And they must not have been defeated decisively by another great power. And what we mean by decisively is that defeated so poorly that they're no longer a great power. like the U.S. defeat of Japan. And you can see in these different periods the rise and fall of different powers. Austria 
was a very powerful state for a long time. And then it became Austria-Hungary, and then it lost a lot of its relative power compared to other states. You can see the persistence of some states like France and England, and then they too fall off as their economies are eclipsed by more powerful, faster growing states. These are the different great powers in different uh, periods. You can see Great Britain, France, Russia and the Soviet Union, Austria, Hungary, Prussia, Germany, Italy, the US, Japan, and China. You can see in the picture the Yalta Conference of 1945, where Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt negotiated the future architecture of Europe and the world after World War II. So these are some obvious facts about war. Contiguous states, meaning states that are next to each other, share a common border, are 35 times more likely to engage in war. For the period of 1816 to 2001, 26.5% or 708 of 2,671 militarized disputes were over territorial issues. So territory matters. 47.7% or 61 of 128 wars in that period involved territorial issues. Territorial disputes are the most war prone of all, meaning if there's a dispute that's territorial, it is a high likelihood of escalating or resulting in war. Number three, war is 30% more likely between dyads with small and medium power differences. In other words, states that are similar or almost similar are more likely to fight each other in power. Number four, the most peaceful dyad consists of non-contiguous, in other words, countries that are not next to each other, minor powers, meaning not major powers, with allies that are democratic, unmilitarized, which means they don't spend a lot on their militaries, in which one state is much larger than the other smaller state. The expected outcome of a conflict here is 0.003 wars per 100 years. Uh, in other words, uh, many centuries would have to pass. In fact, millennia would have to pass before these two countries statistically would ever have a war. Most war-prone dyads would result in 3.29 wars per 100 years. So if you were to take two countries and switch all their values so that they're adjacent, they're uh, major powers with no allies, they're undemocratic, they spend a lot on their military, and in which they're the same size, they would still only have three and a third wars per hundred years. So war is rare. It's something that's unusual, that needs to be explained. Number five, militarized dispute outcomes succeed at resolving issues only 10% of the time as compared with, for example, binding third-party arbitration, which works 77% of the time, or mediation, which works about as often as war. In other words, when you fight, the solution won't last, and you're probably going to fight again. Whereas, if you have a third party coming in, and normally the third party comes in because it's strong and can force itself to come in, states can be kept at peace. So what is a militarized interstate dispute? It's actually a technical term. It's a way of measuring a dispute that's become standardized in the correlates of war project, which is the most common data set used to measure patterns of war in history. All right, we abbreviate this to MID or MID. So. A militarized interstate dispute is an interaction between or among states involving the threat of force. This can include the threat to use force, the threat to blockade, the threat to occupy territory, or the threat to declare war. It can involve the display of force, which is alerting the military force, mobilizing the military force, or shows of force. Or the actual use of force, including blockades, occupation of territory, and other uses of military force, like seizures, declarations of war and acts of war themselves, uh, force between states. 
For MIDs to be counted as disputes, they have to be explicit, overt, non-accidental, and government-sanctioned. An MID is considered to have ended if, after six months, no state has taken any action. This analysis makes use of the great power, minor power distinction. So this is how we distinguish different levels within the MID. This is how we measure it. There are five levels, which are called the hostility levels of an MID. And they go from one to five, where one is no militarized action. Two is the threat to use force, which has occurred in 103 cases in the Correlates of War project, again, which started after the Napoleonic Wars, 1816 to the present. Every now and then they update it to a later date in the data set. Number three is the display of force, which has occurred 569 times. The use of force, which has occurred 1,553 times, is step four. And step five is war itself, which has occurred 107 times. Here you can see the Mexican attack on the independence forces of Texas. So what are some of the findings and patterns of MIDs in the international system? These findings are inductive relations. We count them, but it doesn't mean we know why they happened, and it doesn't mean we even know what the cause is. So we have to provide the theoretical explanation when we link these up with independent variables. So there are 2,586 militarized disputes between 1816 and 2010 in the Correlates of War project. Each dispute has an average of 2.4 participants. 72% of, of MIDs or MIDs are dyadic. In other words, they're occurring between two states and not three or more states. We have examples of India, Pakistan, Argentina, Chile, and their dispute over the Beagle Channel, Iran and Iraq over their uh, frontier disputes, Algeria and Morocco in their disputes over the Tibesti Mountains. Only 5% of MIDs escalate to war, a very small number. Over half of wars are bilateral. So once these wars escalate, uh, about half of them involve only two states fighting. An average of 3.55 states participate in each war, typically at the later stages because states are drawn into the conflict. Now, some states are more important for predicting war than others. 30 states out of the 200 plus states in the international system today have initiated over 70% of all MIDs. And these same states were the primary targets in over 60% of the MIDs. And 9 of 10 most dispute-prone states are major powers. So this tells us that the major power matters, major powers matter. And then these 30 states, whatever their characteristics are, are worthy of study if we want to predict and understand the causes of most wars. Major powers are more likely to escalate disputes, but minor powers, once they're escalated, are more likely to escalate to war. So major, may, maybe major powers are more reticent to cross over that last step to get into the major conflict. Major on major power MIDs are the most likely to escalate. For example, the First World War, you had a Serbian-Austro-Hungarian dispute over an assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand that ultimately involved Russia and Germany, and this increased its likelihood of escalating. Major powers are more likely to initiate disputes with minor powers than the reverse, probably because minor powers are afraid. I don't mean to anthropomorphize, but they're rendered insecure by confronting the major state. It was easier for the U.S. to bring military force to bear against Grenada than for Grenada in the Caribbean in 1983 to threaten the U.S. directly. While nuclear weapons have had no impact on the frequency and level of disputes in the international system, it has shifted disputes from the major to the minor powers. So 
during the Cold War, you didn't have a major military clash between East and West Germany. Both had nuclear weapons. There was probably a concern that any confrontation would escalate to nuclear war. So we see a lot of disputes in the developing world. And it's thought perhaps these are proxy conflicts, that the major powers are competing with each other through minor powers, and so there's a shift of disputes. But that may not necessarily be true. Proxy conflicts may not actually exist at all. Major power disputes declined from 50 to 75 percent before 1945 to only 33 percent as a proportion of all disputes after 1945. So the major powers armed with nuclear weapons are less likely to be involved in a dispute than they were before World War II. Before World War II, the Japanese accidentally bombed American ships, exchanged fire with English ships in China. Uh, there were confrontations uh, in Spain. Um, so uh, you had frequent incidents of great power confrontations in disputes. During the Cold War, that was a rarity. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, the U.S. and Soviet disputes declined sharply. There was learning during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Soviet Union learned to manage peace, or what was called détente, between the two great powers. The Soviet Union learned that being a revisionist state carried with it the danger of a nuclear war, and the Soviet Union became much more restrained. Now, many scholars have argued that proxy conflicts don't exist. Skeptics argue that in the case of Africa, Asia, the Middle East, or Latin America, the superpowers are actually being manipulated by local and regional powers in exchange for their allegiance or help during the Cold War. So war intensity is a measure of the number of actors, and frequency is the measure of how often these wars happen. There is an inverse relationship between war intensity, the number of actors, and war frequency from the period of 1820, again after Napoleonic Wars, and 1997. A tenfold increase in war severity decreases losses and the subsequent probability of war by a factor of 2.6. So when you have a severe number of casualties in a war, the likelihood of war immediately after is much less. People learn that war is undesirable and they're less likely to become involved. Multi-party MIDs last longer. The more countries are involved in a particular dispute, the, the longer that dispute is going to drag on. We think of the First World War. You had a Serbian-Austro-Hungarian dispute that ultimately involved every major power in the international system, including Japan. And that dispute, once it turned into a war, persisted for four and a half long years. Now, there's been some criticism of MIDs. There's been very little effort to demonstrate what causes MIDs to happen in the first place. Two states might confront each other. Why would a dispute happen? There's been instead too much focus on disputes as causes when they're probably actually the effects of underlying causes like hostility or regime types or power distributions or planning, some of these that we're going to look at in due course in these lectures. So we have to ask the question, why do disputes occur at some periods and not in other periods? If you look at the North-South Korean confrontation, there were a great many disputes in the 1970s and 1980s, and far fewer disputes in the 1990s, while North Korea was working on its nuclear weapons program. Here you can see the German generals in Flanders during the First World War. Von Kluck is in the center. Now we can take MIDs and construct out of them larger constructs to analyze war. We call these enduring rivalries. The definition of an enduring rivalry is a hostile military confrontation between two states punctuated by disputes that may also include wars. So here we take 
individual MIDs and we cluster them together when two states are confronting each other. So enduring rivalries are defined according to three categories, although the precise values are in dispute by different scholars. And there's little effect on what an enduring rivalry includes or excludes depending on which literature you read. So here are some of the categories. First of all, there's the severity condition, which is the number of MIDs that must occur in sequence for there to be an enduring rivalry. There's the continuity condition, which is the maximum gap in years between MIDs for there to be an enduring rivalry. If too much time passes after a dispute, maybe the countries are no longer hostile to each other. There's the termination condition, which is the number of time that must pass for an enduring rivalry to end. Some of the conventional wisdom criteria is three to five MIDs will create a proto-rivalry and six MIDs and more will create an enduring rivalry. These are conventions. They're not universally agreed upon. In this picture, you can see the maneuvering of Chinese soldiers in their 1979 invasion of Vietnam. So here you can see the impact of changing the threshold for the number of disputes. If two MIDs will create rivalries, then we have 127 rivalries of which the average duration is three MIDs. If, on the other hand, we raise it to six, we see we have 15 rivalries, of which an average rivalry duration is 20 MIDs. And if we go up to 10 number of disputes, we're looking at only three rivalries, with an average rivalry duration of 33. This is one conception, and it's sort of a sensitivity analysis of how many MIDs are included to make an enduring rivalry. So these are the enduring rivalries list. You could write a paper covering one of these to try to explain why it's endured. At the top you have Russia Japan 1895 to 1976 and they're still in dispute although disputes are not militarized necessarily over Russia's occupation of Sakhalin. You have the U.S. and Mexico between 1836 and 1893, and that includes uh, the um, Mexican-American War. You've got Greece and the uh, Ottoman Empire, 1829 to 1919. Long list of rivalries. Laos and North Vietnam, Chile and Argentina. You have Britain and Italy, Bolivia and Chile, Somalia, Ethiopia, Iraq and Israel. A very rich list to be exploited. You can see in the pictures the result of the Chile-Peru naval conflict in which Chile defeated the Peruvians. You can also see British Gurkha soldiers patrolling in Belize on the Guatemalan border. Here you can see a close-up of enduring interstate rivalries with a number of dispute initiations for Argentina-Chile, uh, Chile versus Argentina. You can see Argentina is typically the uh, initiator. China-India, in which China initiates four, but uh, India in turn initiates three. China and the USSR, where China initiates all six. Ecuador and Peru, in which Ecuador initiates five which is curious because Ecuador is the smaller country. So you can repackage and examine these enduring rivalries by looking at the different characteristics of MIDs. So what are some of the statistics? Well, there are 115 rivalries over a period uh, between 1816 and 2001. Eighty percent of rivalries are power asymmetric, such as the U.S. and Haiti, where you've got a big power confronting a much smaller power with 42% of enduring rivalries, including at least 13 MIDs, and in other words, a lot of disputes. This is interesting, since we'd expect the more powerful states to prevail. 65% of disputes in enduring rivalries occur within two years of each other, so there's a quick sort of sequence between each other. Here you can see uh, U.S. Marines in Haiti, both in the uh, early and late 20th centuries. 
uh, both as a result of sort of intervention invasions. Why do enduring rivalries matter? Interestingly, 45% of all MIDs since 1816 have occurred within an enduring rivalry. 53% of all interstate wars occurred within an enduring rivalry. So enduring rivalries matter for over half of all important wars. The remaining 31% of wars occurred in dyadic rivalries that were too short to be classified as an enduring rivalry, but could have been classified as a proto-rivalry. 10 of the 12 great power wars since 1816 have begun within enduring rivalries. So great powers matter, enduring rivalries matter, and great powers in enduring rivalries are a very powerful uh, associate with the outbreak of war, something worthy of study. Disputes in an enduring rivalry are two to eight times as likely to escalate as disputes outside of an enduring rivalry. Territorial changes within an enduring rivalry are three times as likely to be violent as non-enduring rivalry disputes. But we know this, territory matters. And if it's an enduring rivalry, it means there's recurring fights over the same territory. Therefore, if we want to understand most wars, we have to focus on those enduring rivalries. They're not necessarily the cause of war, but they seem to concentrate causes within their dynamic if we can unpackage them. So here you can see a list of those cases where the foundation of new states and the end of major conflict created new rivalries. So how do enduring rivalries end? 90% of enduring rivalries end with a systemic shock, such as a war or a major state failure. One which occurred in my lifetime was the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 which abruptly ended the Cold War. It's difficult to attribute causation in that case, but when I traveled to the Soviet Union in the 1980s, in Moscow and uh, Uzbekistan in Central Asia, my impression was that the Soviet Union was collapsing because of jeans, coke, and rock and roll. Soviet citizens no longer cared about the goals of socialism because they'd already been achieved. They wanted to have the lifestyle they imagined was occurring in the West, and so they abruptly changed their allegiance from the communist model to a consumer model, and the whole system collapsed. So there's a number of discrete causes for this kind of termination of an enduring rivalry. First of all, you could have another rivalry for example, the Franco-German enduring rivalry that went from the rise of Prussia at the end of the 17th and 18th centuries ended with the rise of the Soviet Union. And then Germany and France came together eventually in uh, NATO to stand off against the Warsaw Pact threat to Central and Western Europe. A rivalry could be terminated by power preponderance. Mexico used to challenge the U.S. both through non-state actors as well as through regional influence. But after the U.S. invaded Mexico and took about a third of its real estate in the form of California, New Mexico, Arizona, uh, and other states, Mexico lost so much significant power, it lost even the effort to try to compete with the U.S. by creating a military anywhere remotely strong enough to defend itself. A third possible cause of the end of a rivalry is the introduction of third parties. 
relations improved between the Soviet Union and the United States because of the rise of China. So in the 1970s, the Soviet Union uh, was reeling from its 1969 conflict with China, which China initiated. So the Soviets moved a third of their military opposite the border of China and sought restrained relations with the West. So there was some thought that the Sino-Soviet split and the uncertainty as to where China's future allegiance would lie caused insecurity in both the US and the Soviet Union. The British-American rivalry, which basically lasted in parts from the time of the independence of the US until about 1870, when the rise of Germany caused the English essentially to surrender the security of Canada and their economic interests in Latin America to the US because the British didn't want to both confront Germany and the US and instead saw the US as a potential future ally. Number four, it was statistically found that disputes within enduring rivalries tend to decline as states approach power parity. In other words, countries are going to have fewer disputes between each other if they're able to withstand each other's threats. And an example of this is Iran and Iraq. After the 1975 Algiers Agreement, Iraq and Iran made a temporary peace. When the revolution in Iran severely weakened its military power, the disputes multiplied, in part because Iran provoked uh, Iraq and in part because Iraq saw weakness in Iran. And number five, enduring rivalries can be ended by agreement. Specific uh, disputes due to territorial disagreements and more often because of plebiscites where local people will make a vote as to which side they want to join. Less often do treaties solve the same problem. Treaties are typically associated with recurrence of war. So Trieste, a city in Italy that was claimed by Yugoslavia at the end of World War II and has a long disputatious history because of Slovenes and Croats and Italians that live there, was solved by plebiscite, joined Italy, and now the dispute is largely dormant, if not completely over. Whereas the dispute in Kashmir between India and Pakistan has never been solved, in part because there has been no plebiscite. Uh, the Indian government refuses to allow the Kashmiris a vote to determine what country they would join. So how did the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States end without a war? Earlier, how did the British-American rivalry end without war? One author, called Rock, found that enduring rivalries terminate under the following three conditions. Number one, the creation of economic complementarity. The British and American economic trade goals were mutually exclusive initially. The British had an exclusive empire. They didn't want other powers to trade within that empire. But as the British engaged in trade at the end of the 19th century, a lot of these limitations were loosened and the British and American goals became compatible. Number two, cultural compatibility. The British and Americans had a common ground for communication particularly in terms of their pursuit of democracy, at least within their metropolitan state. And number three, not in political competition. The Americans didn't interfere with the British Empire, although they certainly encouraged India to get independence from the British. And the British recognized the exclusive nature of American influence in North, Central and South America. And so they didn't compete strategically. Hensel, one of the researchers of enduring rivalries, found that enduring rivalries that do not terminate early 
tend to last a very long time. So what's the statistical evidence? The recurrence of conflict does not follow any generational lines, and therefore there's no evidence that a generation that remembers war is less likely to go to war subsequently. It was thought that during the Cold War, many of the Soviet leaders that had suffered during World War II, such as uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, had fought, or rather been a political commissar, at the Battle of Stalingrad and seen great suffering, that therefore the Soviet Union was reluctant to go to war. But if you look at Germany after World War I, scarcely a generation passed before Germany embarked on an even wider, longer, and more violent conflict in World War II. So clearly there was no aversion, generationally speaking, against a new conflict. There is some disagreement that war weariness only applies to states that have lost more than one million casualties, according to one study. Here you can see a picture of Indonesia and its dispute with trying to capture Sabah and Sarawak, which were then part of the British uh, Empire in the early 1960s. The British ultimately were able to hold off the Indonesians from their territorial aggrandizement and lead uh, Malaysia to independence. So when do wars occur within enduring rivalries? There's a fundamental dispute over when wars are most likely to occur in enduring rivalries. It has mainly to do with two interpretations of how decision makers learn within enduring rivalries. Samuel Huntington has argued that wars tend to occur early in arms races because newly established states and new enemies find it difficult to measure their relative strengths. They therefore enter into war because it's not clear which is the weaker side. So learning for Huntington is substantive learning. Countries change their goals based on their early experiences with their rivalry and this makes war less likely later on because states will choose more attainable goals. This has some evidence. We could think of the 1947-1949 uh, Arab-Israeli War where the Arab states and Israel learned about the limits of their capability, which then meant subsequent wars were much shorter, smaller, narrower, had fewer participants. The 1947-1948 First Indo-Pakistan War over Kashmir didn't recur on the same scale for at least a decade. The 1950-1953 Korean War didn't recur at all. In effect, the longer the enduring rivalry, the more likely the states will learn to interact peacefully. Now, Russell Leng has a contradictory approach and conclusion. Leng conducted a study of repeated deterrence failures using the MID dataset. He found that wars are more likely to occur late in a rivalry, specifically the third dispute, because with each subsequent dispute, each state hardens its commitment and is therefore more likely to escalate to war. So as rivalries endure, st states shift an increasingly large portion of their attention against that single other adversary. So the U.S.'s focus on the Soviet Union has meant that the U.S. is still focusing today on Russia, long, you know, long decades after the Soviet threat has diminished, and is practically ignoring other major states like India and Brazil, which have similar sized economies. So for Russell Lang, learning is instrumental, not substantive. States learn how to manage their tactics, but they don't change their final goals. And his examples, uh, here you can see in a picture the uh, essentially the uh, Greek invasion of Turkey attempting to uh, possess and liberate the Greeks in Ionian Asia Minor, which then uh, failed with the uh, Turkish counterattack and the uh, ethnic cleansing or exchange of populations, Turks 
moving from Greece and Bulgaria to Turkey and Greeks moving from Turkey to Greece. So we see instrumental learning between 1965 and 1971, where India and Pakistan focused more on each other, purchased weapons to confront each other, and it led to a series of conflicts. 1965, Pakistan tried to liberate Kashmir from India. India retaliated. 1971, when a revolt occurred in East Pakistan, India invaded and detached and gave East Pakistan its independence as Bangladesh. 1974, Greek and Greece and Turkey had a dispute over Cyprus, which resulted in the Turkish invasion uh, of northern uh, Cyprus. 1967-1973, you see recurrences of an Arab-Israeli conflict. In 1967, uh, Israel captured the Sinai, the West Bank, and the Golan. And in 1973, Syria and Egypt had to reclaim the Golan and the Sinai. 1980, Iran-Iraq War was a culmination of border wars in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. In the 1962 Sino-Indian conflict, seems to have set the stage for a whole series of border clashes between India and China since. In effect, the longer the enduring rivalry, the more likely state relations will deteriorate into war. So what are some of the criticisms of these approaches? Well, some academics argue that disputes sort of let off steam. And again, I warned against using uh, metaphors, but the idea that they reduce tension and thereby make war less likely by clarifying the relative strengths of the powers. Whereas an absence of disputes can indicate a complete lack of communication and the dangerous accumulation of grievances that could make war more likely. Think of North and South Korea. North Korea is hardly more Pacific, more moderate, more friendly to South Korea in the 1990s. Whereas in the 1980s it engaged in some pretty aggressive behavior, hijackings, assassinations, kidnappings of Japanese citizens. Uh, in the 1990s, it focused on developing nuclear weapons and long-range missiles. It wasn't more Pacific, it was in fact more aggressive. It was simply tactically restrained so it could accomplish its nuclearization goal without having uh, uh, its project interfered with by, by outside powers. Number two, Hensel argued that war was likely in long-term enduring rivalries, but in the extremely long enduring rivalries, there was a decreased likelihood of war because states learn to live with each other, particularly in issues of nuclear confrontation like the Cold War. So, conclusions on learning and rivalry. If there's no change within the enduring rivalry across the disputes, then learning has not occurred and the rivalry itself is probably being driven from outside any conflict spiral between the two states. So we think of Mozambique and South Africa and their confrontation in the 1990s. The Mozambique government wanted to get Soviet foreign aid, the Frelimo government. The South Africans wanted to stop Mozambique from becoming a sanctuary for the African National Congress, which was trying to overthrow apartheid. And so South Africa intervened in Mozambique. Was Mozambique's goal actually to liberate South Africa? It's difficult to tell. It's very likely that the dynamic was one searching for available foreign aid, particularly in the form of military resources, so that Frelimo could consolidate itself in Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, against uh, Renamo, which was uh, essentially a large insurgency sponsored by the South Africans. Janice Grosstein, a professor at the University of Toronto, has argued that learning is difficult. States cling to core beliefs unless there is overwhelming disconfirmatory evidence, which rarely occurs even with a war in an enduring rivalry. You would think that the major powers would have learned something from World War I, uh, but the lessons they learned was that stumbling into war was easy, and so some of the states, like England, didn't have a deterrent policy in uh, the lead up to World War II, uh, thereby facilitating the emergence of Adolf Hitler. So some of the wrong lessons were learned, even in apocalyptic events like the First World War. So what, what are the 
conclusions from the statistical body of work. It was found that in half of enduring rivalries, war occurs by the third dispute in 50% of cases of enduring rivalries, and by the sixth MID dispute in 90% of rivalries, which generally validates Huntington. So what are some of the methodological problems? So, the methodological problems. What about rivalries that don't have disputes? Right? We spoke about this earlier, the North-South Korean rivalry. There's not a lot of disputes in the 1990s, and this hides the fact that there is a very high level of tension between those two countries. Number two, different types of disputes. There's been very little study to see if the MIDs within enduring rivalries can be distinguished between each other. We're going to look later on at theories by Ned LeBeau, and he makes distinctions between different kinds of disputes. We have a whole lecture on it. It's fascinating. No breakdown of different kinds of disputes within enduring rivalries has been done. Perhaps that should be done, and that perhaps that'll show uh, different kinds of enduring rivalries. Is there uh, a difference in the likelihood of war based on the qualitative difference of the kinds of disputes? Number three. What disputes are deterred by general deterrence and therefore remain submerged? We're going to talk more about general deterrence later, but it's when a country is so powerful, other countries don't even consider challenging it. Picture the U.S. and Mexico. Mexico does not even try to compete with U.S. military power. The U.S. is simply vastly more powerful. But imagine an alternate history where there's a huge nuclear exchange and the U.S. is destroyed in a nuclear uh, exchange with the Soviet Union. Suddenly the U.S. is only 10% as powerful as it was. Would Mexico resurrect dormant disputes and reclaim Texas and take military action against the U.S. to uh, recover the territories lost during the Mexican-American War? Uh, so general deterrence is important because a lot of power that states exhibit submerge and make disputes dormant so they're no longer visible. But it doesn't mean those disputes can't re-emerge at a later time. So essentially the question is, does opportunity rather than provocation motivate the emergence of some disputes? Now we've seen uh, the role of Zionism in the Middle East, the creation of Israel. But what we've not seen is the competition by the Hashemite, Jordanian monarchy, to claim greater Syria in competition with Damascus, which is also claimed uh, to be the center of greater Syria. Had Israel never occurred, it's just as likely that Jordan or Syria would have fought over control of Palestine to try to unify all the territory from the Sinai to the Persian frontier. Basically, the, the dream of a greater Syria. And perhaps this uh, dispute is still dormant, but simply hidden under the shadow of the new power relations in the region. So if there is a rivalry without disputes, what other indicators could we use to identify this? Uh, the writings of certain ideologues, um, poetry, um, obscure political movements that could uh, re-emerge. Number four, what affects the framing of territorial disputes? We're going to look at this later on uh, because it's an important issue. Um, we're going to look at prospect theory, which is the issue of decision-making under risk. Sometimes states remember losses for generations. Certainly the Vietnamese have a memory of ethnic Vietnamese that still live today across the border in China. But in other cases, countries quickly forget they've lost territories. There isn't much, at least, of an overt movement in Germany remembering the loss of East Prussia, what is today Kaliningrad. The Soviet Union uh, uh, didn't remember the loss of Alaska, the sale of Alaska in 1867 to the U.S. So some disputes fade away 
because the territory that was lost is forgotten. And other times, they're not forgotten. Why? A more nuanced approach to rivalries is strategic rivalry, which was developed by Coloresi, Rassler, and Thompson. Here they make a classification system of six different kind of rivalries. Very often a rivalry has more than one. A key distinction is between spatial rivalry, when you have two countries typically adjacent to each other territorially, meaning they're next to each other, and they're fighting over territory. A second type is positional. Here you have great powers in the international system that are competing for influence. And they're not so much concerned with territory as they are concerned with a much more important element, and that is influence over other countries, including allies. So spatial is very common between countries that share borders and have disputes. Positional is the type of rivalry you have between the major powers. And it's this kind of rivalry that is most consequential for the international system. There are other rivalries, like ethnic rivalry, when you've got a, an ethnic group from one country in another group, and the first country has an interest in the fate of the ethnicity. Uh, this can include irredentism. There are issues of dissidence, where one country will provide sanctuary to a government that's out of power, that is violently trying to overthrow a neighboring government. There is a fight over land containing resources like oil, coal, water, and soil. And then there is rivalry over access, strategic access like canals, rivers, and isthmuses, which typically means the country's trying to get access to oil, coal, water, and soil or to a warm water port. Very often there's multiple rivalries that are occurring at the same time. Now, the importance of strategic rivalries is that it disagrees fundamentally with the enduring rivalries literature that relies on putting together series of militarized interstate disputes and using them to define rivalries. Coloresi, Razzler, and Thompson instead go and create a list of rivalries that they call strategic rivalries by looking at the historical record and documentary evidence. So they don't use disputes to define rivalries because they believe there's an endogeneity problem, which is in the enduring rivalries literature, they use disputes chained together to then determine if there's a rivalry. But disputes don't create rivalries. It's the underlying rivalry that creates disputes strategically. Countries will engage in disputes sometimes because they want to justify an action, sometimes because there's unintended escalation. It's complex, but you don't start with the dispute. You start um, with the rivalry. So these are some of their uh, findings. Uh, based upon their database, which is different, that attempts to solve the endogeneity problem um, with the militarized interstate dispute approach in enduring rivalries. First, a territorially adjacent dyad, two countries that are next to each other, who've had no prior crises, will typically go for about 75 years before a crisis happens. For all dyads, that's major power dyads and minor uh, dyads, the absence of a crisis will typically lead to 55 years of peace, meaning there's no dispute between the countries. A first crisis will bring this down to seven years, meaning seven years before, on average, the next crisis will occur. And a third crisis brings that down to three years, a dramatic drop. Non-major dyads, meaning not the major powers, meaning not countries that have 10% or more power in the international system, will typically have no war for 326 years. But if they have a single crisis, that drops down to 107 years. Territorially adjacent dyads increase the likelihood of war by 30 six times. In other words, two countries that are next to each other are 36 times more likely to have a war than if they're not. So being territorially adjacent does matter. They used a data set that included the 384 territorial disputes that have been recorded for the period of 1919 to 1995, uh, which they obtain in their book. Now, positional rivalries by major powers, 
And these are the major powers that are sensitive, not to territory, but to the influence they have over allies and enemies in neutral states, are far more war-prone than conflicts over territory. So we often think that territory is uh, uh, mo pro probably most frequently the cause of war. But for the major power general wars in which we've had most of the deaths, these are fights between great powers. They are not fighting between ter over territory. They are fighting over something much more important, which is influence in the international system.